Stuart Jackson is a senior lecturer in the Department of Government and International Relations with a specialization in Australian politics at the University of Sydney. His broad interests cover a breadth of green politics in Australia and the Asian Pacific with a special interest in party development. Prior to becoming an academic, Dr. Jackson has, involved, has been involved in green politics for over 20 years as a party activist, including a period as national convener of the Australian Greens. Uh, Dr. Jackson, thank you for joining me. My pleasure, Dan. Um, okay, just to uh, start off, uh, there seems to be a groundswell of I suppose anti-establishment um, feeling within the populace, not just in Australia but across the world, for quite a few years now. Yep. Uh, what is your assessment of the political climate in Australia at the moment? At the moment, um, well, there's several things going on at the same time, um, as you can imagine. Uh, here we are in the lead up to a federal election. So we're in, in if you like, an election period. Um, so of course, uh, politics is somewhat animated at the best of times. We're just coming out of a pandemic, which has dampened public protest to a certain extent, certainly in the first year of the pandemic um, in 2020. Um, less so in 2021, as the prospect of being vaccinated, animated people who were already anti Vax. Um, there's been a, a, an anti-vaccination movement in Australia for quite a number of years. That has made some interesting links, um, certainly in the last six months, with uh, the, for want of a better term, the freedom movement. Um, they've existed for quite some time. They've generally been on the far right. Um, they've generally been anti-immigration um, as part of their platform. Um, they've relative, been a relatively small minority. You would have seen the parties on occasion um, stand up. Um, what was the, there's, a, there's a couple that are particularly prom were particularly prominent, um, but they've tended to fade to the side. What's occurred in the last six months? Yeah, really over the last six months is that a set of different groups have started to coalesce together. So your anti-vaccination group, tended to be in your, um, I don't want to say hippie groups, but it's tended to be alternative health, um, alternative lifestyle, and that's tended to be those groups um, who've aligned themselves with um, the freedom groups, anti-immigration groups, uh, people who, for want of a better term, might be called anarchists. So there's a large range of different groups that are coming together to say government at the moment is not assisting us, it's forcing us to do things, uh, it's too big or it's not acting in our interests. Interesting part about the last Freedom Rally uh, was that there was actually separate stages for different parts of the, the organisation. So it wasn't as if there was one uh, homogenous uh, group. It was actually quite uh, heterogeneous. There was actually lots of different parts of it. Um, the camp, um, I, I go on about this because it was a large gathering that didn't do particularly well and certainly were derided by Canberrans, who of course have the highest vaccination rate in Australia. Nonetheless, they're a quite significant um, group. They're mobile, they're prepared to protest, and they're using tactics that in the past has been quite well used by the left uh, of politics. Now, the point about this new uh, co coalition, if you like, or coalescing, um, is that it's a mixture of people who otherwise might have defined themselves on the left and the right, but around the issues about government intrusion. So there's your anti-establishment block. Anti-establishmentism um, has been around in Australia since whenever we talk about our egalitarian um, uh, sense of ourselves. You know, as Australians, we're egalitarian, we're raconteurs, we're always, you know, thumbing our nose at authority. Uh, 
that's actually not terribly true in the last you know, 30 or 40 years. We're actually very good at following the rules. You will have noted most people follow the rules during the pandemic. Most people follow the rules if there's a flood emergency or a fire emergency. We're actually really good at following rules. Um, however, that doesn't mean we like the rules all the time. Um, the Australian Electoral Survey, which has been tracking uh, uh, trust in government has noted it's been falling for quite some time since the, the 80s or 70s in fact um, but it's really started to plumb the depths in the last really since 2013 um, the, the 2013 election uh, there was still a certain amount of trust in government um, certainly uh, government and opposition you know, yes government will do what it says it does the experience of the 2014 budget was very negative. The 2016 election had been, a, a, again, a big drop in a trust in government. And so when we come down to 2019, nobody trusts anybody at this point. Not, not quite that. But it's fallen from highs of you know 70 to 80% to around only half the population trust in government. Uh, now, government, of course, is the, the amorphous thing that you, you place parliament, the rules, you know, the man, etc. That doesn't mean they don't trust individual politicians or that they don't trust you know, particular individuals in particular parties. But generally, the establishment is not trusted any, anymore. Not certainly not in the way that it's perhaps trusted by our you know, parents or grandparents, particularly grandparents. So it's been growing, this anti-establishment. Anti-establishmentarianism is one of those words you can throw a, throw a bunch of letters at, create a word, but it's been growing for a period of time. Um, where it will end up, I'm not sure, because you're seeing different movements uh, coming into, not fruition, but certainly making their mark. You've seen the youth climate movement emerge. This is important, not just because it's a climate movement. There have been a, a climate movements and climate rallies going back, well, <laughs> for 20 years. But what's important about this one is it's being generated primarily by young people themselves. So not being generated by the usual suspects in the environment movement or the Green Party or wherever. It's actually been generated by the young people themselves. So in schools, their own networks, separate from adult networks. They're revisiting um, politics, they're revisiting democracy, separate from how we understand it and the norms around political behavior. You could say that's anti-establishment, um, or you could just say they're redeveloping it their own way. Because, you know, in 10 years' time, they'll be the, the voting public, or, you know, a lot less they'll be voting public, but they'll be the people who are emerging into political parties or as candidates or as more fully-fledged activists saying, well, we want an independent parliament or we want a different kind of parliament or we want different access. So, yes, rise in anti-establishment uh, behaviour, coming from the left and the right of politics, coalescing in new and different ways to how we normally associated it with, you know, a left-wing party like the Labor Party, the Greens or the Communist Party versus a right-wing party like the Labor Party, um, the National Party or One Nation. Um, we're now seeing something different emerging. Mm -hmm. There's uh, quite a lot to unpack <laughs> with, with that one. Um, uh, where should I start? Um, is there any legitimacy to the anti-establishment um, uh, argument? I mean, it's easy to dismiss them as conspiracy theorists and crackpots and, and, and troublemakers, but is there any legitimacy to their, their, their concerns about government overreach and the intrusion? Um, I, I would say there's some concern about this type of thing dating all the way back to 9-11. When 9-11 happened, it was the whole, I, and it was predominantly coming from the left because I suppose the right was in charge at the time for, mo for the most part. But, um, you know, the whole idea of um, uh, the surveillance state and government intrusion and the Patriot Act and, and all these other things. And, uh, 
going on to what you said when people are now angry and they don't trust the government anymore well you know I, I would say we've been lied to so many times from both regardless of which political party's in charge regardless if it's bush or obama or uh, or hillary or trump or anyone else biden or anyone else um uh over various things uh, and, and the idea of the trust the experts well they've been wrong on so many things for so long i mean back in the day they didn't see the Soviet union collapsing they didn't see the 9 11 happening they didn't see uh 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 oh wait financial crisis come, creeping uh, crept up on them somehow uh i mean there's so many examples you could give so now we've finally reached you know 2022 um is there any legitimacy to the anger um there is but let, let's let's wind it back a, a, a step there's always been a certain um what can we say a certain tendency to think that the establishment is the establishment but it doesn't always get it right the whole history of the soviet union is replete with jokes made by ordinary Russians about the system, about, you know, uh, well, I, I won't go into the individual jokes themselves, but, but essentially saying that the system doesn't really work. You know? Reagan, uh, Reagan did plenty of those jokes back in, back in his day, yeah. In, in, indeed he did, but Russians were doing it themselves. They were aware that the system didn't work um, as, as it was said it was going to work, but they worked out how you could manage within that particular system. I think you'll find there's been um, satirists all the way through. I mean, whether it be Chaucer being a, you know, a satirist about um, the the <laughs> about the behaviour of knights and priests and women uh, coming up to them, and, you know, the whole thing is this is going back, you know, eight hundred years, nine hundred years, no, eight hundred years. Um, so people were satirising. So people were saying, yeah, everything's not working how they want us to believe it's working. But we get on and we work within it because it provides certain benefits to us. Certainly when you come to the Second World War, there was plenty of people who were opposed to the war but signed up to fight. This happened in the First World War as well. Uh, most of the, well, the various communist parties but socialists in different countries were opposed to the war. I was saying it's a capitalist war, but when it came down to it, they said, they, were, they said, all right, we're in a war, we're going to have to fight because we're fighting the fascists or we're fighting, you know, the evil empire or whatever, however you want to place it, and we'll have to place our trust in the military planners, the generals, etc. The Second World War, most military planners and generals had worked out where things went so badly wrong in the First World War, um, notably generalship was still a part-time job it had become much more professional by the second world war and they actually were trying to you know look after soldiers not get too many killed and you know, not be bloodthirsty lunatics uh, some of them always creep through Patton was one that seemed to always want to you know charge the tanks into the, the, the face of the enemy artillery yeah you know a bit um, you know uh, was it charge of light brigade sometimes so it's always been there, but the general trust was available, said, no, we have to trust them. We're the ordinary people. Uh, we can trust them up to a certain, point, a certain point. In democracies, of course, you have the option of voting them out and hopefully getting a better set, a different set or something that might actually work. So Winston Churchill, hugely supported during the war, comes to the end of the war, is voted out. Right? Mm. Who's, who would have thought it? It's because people said, yeah, we've had the war. Yeah, you were great during the war. Now we want something different. Right? And that was the general mood. It doesn't mean that they're anti-establishment, but they want to change the pieces um, that are operating within that. Accepting how business operated, how you know, the state operated, what security was. And, and there's plenty of people who have been criminals and conspiracy theorists on the side. But the bulk of people were on board. You come to... Um, the 80s, you mentioned Reagan. Um, Reagan was trusted, loved, um, tolerated. Um, you know, in retrospect, he seems like a relatively cuddly fellow compared to you know what we've ended up with since. 
Um, yes, he was anti-tax. Yes, he uh, did create, um, he created a rod for America's back and certainly allowed the Pentagon to continue its, you know, uh, overweening desire to have as much as possible, you know, in terms of money and then in terms of toys without necessarily being efficient about it. Uh, you had the beginnings of uh, the enormous debts that have, that have been piling up in the US ever since. Um, you had you know, income tax levels, which under Eisenhower had reached 100%, 102%, I believe was the highest taxation rate available in the US at one point. And he was pulling them down to you know 25%. You know, or thirty percent, depending on where you were, who you were. And the idea was to get it to ten and twenty percent. That is for business and for individuals. A very low taxing government. Um, of course, you still got to pay for all those, you know, big military toys. Uh, where's the money going to come from? Uh, well, it comes from all the other programs. That starts to undo, you know, if you like, social fabric building which had occurred post-war, right? So being able to have Medicaid, being able to have, uh, in Australia, you know, the development finally of Medicare, we'd already had the widow's pension, we had all the social um, fabric uh, strengtheners from government. Uh, now it's starting to be pulled apart, you know? Um, that's what we're seeing now, right? So when we have big expenditure, low taxing, but big expenditure on military items, so you know, all these new submarines we're getting and all these new tanks we're getting and all this new military hardware we're getting, but there isn't bushfire assistance or when it's promised, it's not delivered or there's no flood assistance or disaster management's pretty second rate or our big fires are run by volunteers, not by paid firefighters, by volunteers. It's like, well, hang on, where's the government in all this? Isn't this what we pay our taxes for? So you can see how uh, a certain element of what are they doing builds up. Well, Go on. I, I would add to that. Um, I like previous generation. It seems to be, this is probably the case always been, but I think it's been never been so much as it is now. But the perception, at least or legitimate um, concern that the two parties seems to be on the issues that really matter they seem to be in agreement and and that's why where uh, okay you can uh, you got your brand you got your partisanship you got your whatever and you can maybe argue on the side uh, tax rate or or whatever but that's just kind of fiddling on on, on, on the sides when it comes to the legitimate problems like a big issues like i don't know you, 9-11, the war on terror, and even now today with Ukraine and, and Russia and, 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 and all that, your, your, your opinion on, 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 on the war and what we should we do and, and should we embrace uh, this policy or non-intervention or whatever, yep. um, both major parties are all for it, are all for the war, for, for example. And, yes. if you, and if you say, no, I'm against it, or you're un-Australian, you're anti-American, you're, you're pro-Putin, you're pro-whatever, oh, yes. and, 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 and that's not even being pro-whatever, it's just, just being analytical and objective in as you assess the scenery. I, I, actually, and, I'll give you an example of exactly what you're talking about. Last night, there was um, a Q&A. Oh, yeah, it was not, kicked out. Yeah. yeah, the 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 the, the Russian chap Sasha, who I thought, well, hang on, I think he's been on before. Well, I don't watch Q and A very often. Um, Sasha always yeah. manages yeah. to get into it, so you know he managed to get the his name in the in the headlines, being pro Russian, and perhaps you know the, the question itself when you when you actually read the question, you go, well, that's not so bad because it raises the question about well, what's been happening in Donbass, you know, is there or do uh, Russians in, in Ukraine feel oppressed some way as second class citizens or, you know, literally oppressed by the Ukrainian majority. Um, is that a legitimate concern and complaint? And is that what sparked off, you know, the desire to be separate? Uh, the fact that they ended up having to fight the far right nationalists in the uh, Azov regiment or brigade, you know, it's like, wow, that's, that's, it, it actually did occur 
um, when they set up their area, it's why they never got to marry a poll, um, is that the far right came in, far right nationalists came in on favour of the Ukrainian um, state. Uh, they got integrated eventually into the uh, mainstream army. Uh, well, so, well, are we talking about the actual neo-Nazis themselves? Yes, the actual, yeah. as, of, as of Brigade, the actual neo-Nazis were integrated into the Ukrainian army. Now, they're a small part uh, of it, but you can start to see when, you know, people in uh, the Donbass region, particularly in the two breakaway parts of uh, Luhansk and uh, Donetsk region, they're thinking, hey, there's Nazis on the other side. We fought Nazis. Actual, actual Nazis. Actual yeah. Nazis. You know, but that's not what we should be fighting. You know, so uh, there's a certain amount of discussion that needs to happen, at least to be available to discuss. Why is why are we seeing Donbass, uh, Luhansk, and Crimea as well being at the point of going? We want to be separate from Ukraine. We don't want to be part of Europe. We want to be part of Russia. And we'll go as far as breaking the country up. Um, you know, you only have to look at enough maps and you realise that most country boundaries uh, between now and between, say, oh, I don't know, uh, treaties of, of Westphalia or the Peace of Westphalia, you know, mid-17th century to now, have changed dramatically and do change periodically. The last time they had a big change, well, that was only, uh, let's see, 1945. Well, it's Yalta that actually made the decision, or Tehran, no, Yalta, they made the decision to how to carve up Western Europe and who will get which bits. Um, the fact is that uh, Poland used to have parts of, um, of uh, well, in fact, the, yeah, Poland used to have parts of Ukraine. L Lviv used to be Lvov. Uh, it used to be there, you know, part of Poland up until 19. Well, after the war, obviously. So there's there's a there's been changing boundaries. It doesn't mean that there's not ethnic groups or you know there's not a claim to to nationality or ethnicity or to language that can't be uh, made very clear. Keep in mind though, people also do shift the border. The border areas are where you get it starts to get confused. You know the border between. Uh, Poland and Ukraine, the, the border between uh, Slovakia, uh, yet Slovakia and uh, Poland and Ukraine is they've moved around between well what would have been Lithuania, you know, parts of Lithuania, but Lithuania shrunk dramatically uh, um, from what it was say 150 years ago, but it actually grew slightly, um, you know, after the Second World War with the the loss of, well, Memel territory, which is really part of East Prussia. So my point being, there's been this shift around. We have to be able to have that discussion. What Stan Grant did you know, was to throw someone out who he says, you're advocating violence. Said, okay, but that's exactly what plenty of people in Australia and in New Zealand, and in fact, the whole of the West are saying, I'll go and fight in Ukraine. They are in fact advocating violence. We'll send you violent weapons. But we need to be able to at least accommodate this person uh, to say, okay, you have a viewpoint. We vehemently disagree with it. We don't need to platform your particular viewpoint. We can answer the claims that you make. And I think that's what I think was done from everything I've read, was done effectively by the panel. Shot down, you know, target is bullshit, say, no, you're completely wrong, and these are the reasons why. You know, um, that's what action needs to happen. That's the, the free speech paradigm. Um, but let's be clear that in the middle of a, a war, and it is a war uh, between Ukraine and uh, Russia, Russia claims otherwise, so it's just a military action. Yeah, you know, semantics at this point. Um, there is a war going on, people are dying, civilians, children. Um, you know, particularly women and children are getting killed. Everybody's going, what's well, terrible, particularly the kids. Um, it's always the kids. The important point then is why do we have a necessity to close down the argument, but at the same time um, portray it as a particular, in a particular way? All right, I'm, I've been skating across a few different thoughts on this one. Um, we don't want to eulogize 
uh, the war. So we don't want to be saying, oh, it's wonderful. We don't want to be downplaying it at the same time because people are deaf or dying mm. um, in this military action. And people are really upset. And I talk to Ukrainians in Australia, no, several, um, and they're really upset. You know, they're, their families are there, you know, perhaps, you know, their, their immediate parents, you know, immediate family are getting bombed. Um, that's not pleasant. Why is it different, though, to what's been occurring in Palestine? Why is it, occur, why is it different to how we view Syria? Um, why is it different to a whole range of different conflicts over time? Uh, in one, it's, a, it's an actual piece of military aggression, one state attacking another, which is unusual. Um, state being attacked as a democratic state. Um, and it's, it's Putin has tried to set it up as a reclaim of part of Russia. Um, I'm here I'm thinking of Israel or Israel Palestine. You know, is it one country, two countries? Whose is it? Uh, it's been fought over and disputed for long enough. However, you know, there's a whole lot of issues in discussing it, but we don't give it the same. Um, we don't elevate it to the point where we say we have to defend Palestinians, you know, against Israeli aggression. Mm. We went. We had to defend Israel against Egyptian aggression when Egypt invaded. Okay, that seems fair enough. One state invades another. This takes us back to that treaty, the, that piece of Westphalia, the two treaties, where the idea was you didn't intervene in another country, right? NATO uh, and those sorts of uh, alliances change that in saying, you know, an injury to one is an injury to all. Therefore, we will respond. It didn't stop uh, intervention into um, Kosovo. No, learning the lessons perhaps of the breakup of um, uh, Yugoslavia. Um, however, that was an intervention into another country. Um, that, that's, that comes from a different place around humanitarianism, human rights and the protection of that. The, the cause for intervention into Libya was the same. But it was still intervention by a set of states into another state. Um, well, anyway... Uh uh, I'm, again, well, I've gone a long way from where yeah, we started. It, it, it's interesting. I, actually, I was, I was eventually going to get to the whole Ukraine-Russia conflict, but we've got there uh, earlier than expected. But, but keeping on, on to that topic, though, um, uh, there were a few things that I would want to uh, talk about. One is the idea of... Um, what happened in the q and A? I mm -hmm. believe that's more of a symptom of what's happening, across, like the mentality of some segments of Australia, or not just Australia, but across the world, especially the Western world, where it's, I don't want to hear another opinion. And, 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 and you, know, you know, and regardless if you agree with it or not, even with the whole anti-vax thing, or the uh, or the pro-war, anti-war arguments, or what, whatever, pick pick a topic. Could be anything, but this idea of people not cutting off lifelong friends, family, sometimes, um, uh, it's almost civil war-like. The 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 idea of one there's two there's two groups now. We can't interact. I, I don't want to know you. Uh, I, they were on Facebook. There were plenty of people saying, "Oh, if you agree with whatever the protest or the whatever, defriend me. I don't want to know you." M meaning, I want to just surround myself in my own little echo chamber of people that I agree sure, with. Sure, sure. I mean, uh, but that's but that's been I mean, we've had this. You know, God, I don't know how many. I mean, you know, twenty thousand generations have had that. You know that that old 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 line about you know you can choose your friends but you can't choose your family. You know there's always the you know, it always used to be the racist uncle or the racist you know whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and so we've always had, or, or the in times past it might have been the anti-Semitic you know, yeah, person. Yeah. So, well, so it's been there for a long time. Um, what's what's occurred though is that, that 
uh, things like social well, social media platforms in general have given us access to new people, people we might not otherwise have grown up with or know well uh, or wouldn't otherwise interact with, or we only know peripherally. So we don't have any of those deep, deep or deeper connections um, that we have certainly with family and with close friends. Like I've had close friends who have some fairly, you know, uh, let's call them ordinary views. I don't particularly like them, uh, the, their views, viewpoints, but we can talk about the football. We can talk about other things because right? yeah. there's a, some kind of social bond between us. Uh, agree to disagree. Okay. We talk about politics, we end up fighting. So let's have an agreement that we won't touch that topic yeah. Yeah. and enjoy our friendship. Yeah. in other ways exactly yeah. exactly that, that seems um, to be gone even now. even if you know I, I might you know then proceed to gently prod them over the next 20 years about their views and sometimes they change sometimes my own views change i mean that's just that's part of that exchange uh, between people um, there are people i don't talk to or haven't talked to because i go actually not only are you not prepared to change your viewpoint is so anathematic it's seeping into everything everything else around us mm. actually I, I don't think i can be your friend mm. but that's not an easy thing it's not a, an, i will defriend you bang done or mm. i'll block you which is what you can do with social media and you're immediately cut off from it. mm. it's something you have to you, you come to over a period of time um you know this it's the uh, acquaintance things really it's uh, those people you've known but somehow drift out of contact with and that's okay um, but here you're given the option of just because you're connected on social media and you stay connected until you disconnect as opposed to just take life takes a different course or you change jobs or whatever yeah. here you actually have to take the action of cutting them off people have elevated that to if you say the wrong thing i'm cutting you off and that's elevating that natural drift um, to something more definitive. Uh, and yes, you're right. People then start to surround themselves only with people they agree with. Um, that's always a little problematic um, because it means, you know, what your view of the world is shaped solely around the people you know, who don't know anything else. Mm. And in fact, I was listening to Graham Gill, Professor Graham Gill, um, yesterday talking about authoritarianism and the uh, kid just done he's just got a new book out talking about the rules or norms that uh, authoritarian dictators uh, authoritarian leaders operate by uh, compared to all these different ones one of the things about Putin certainly for the last two years and you can see it in all the setups that he's had of late he has essentially isolated himself okay except from those closest to him those closest to him can sit next to him everybody else like macron you know, emmanuel macron president of france sits at the end of a you know a, a 10 meter table hmm. when he has his council of ministers they're all sitting 10 meters away from him in these enormous rooms that they seem to have in, in this, uh, russia so if he has isolated himself what's he hearing well, he might hear some people saying, well, I don't know if that's a good idea, but there's no uh, actual serious dissent to what he plans to do. You know, what he is hearing, the information is filtered through those people as well. So he's operating in, in somewhat of a, dare I call it a vacuum, um, but yeah, essentially a bit of a vacuum where he's only hearing, um, oh no, it's actually the echo chamber. He's, he's operating in that echo chamber when what he's hearing is essentially what he says they say back and so on and so forth what they say he says back mm. that's a real problem for uh, a, a world leader now that said everybody has their advisors and those advisors will tell them things but a smart one Zelensky is reasonably smart even though he's a comedian no I should say that that's the wrong way around most comedians are very smart that's how they're comedians mm. um he was has been able to remain attached to the real world um, i think by just not taking himself seriously you know not with the pomp and ceremony of say someone who has been part of the establishment all their life and in fact perhaps their parents have been part of that establishment mm. here's an outsider the classic outsider who says no i'm just an ordinary person who gets to be president isn't that great 
but I'm here to do the best I can for, you know, the country, right? the best I can in the best way I can. It's not going to be perfect, right? And it's, you're going to disagree with what I do, but I'm, that's what I'm trying to do. I bet you he has well, his approval rating at the moment amongst um, certainly Ukraine, most Ukrainians. There's probably around 90%. This there's always someone who disagrees with him, but probably around 90%. Mm -hmm. right? Okay. Um, Tony Abbott, when he left, um, when he uh, was, well, there was a push, there was a lib spill, and he ended up not being prime minister. His uh, popularity was very low when he left. Because people had decided, no, you promised a lot and you delivered something completely different. Mm. We didn't get what you promised and you were not honest with us. And hell, you're part of that establishment, you know, that North Shore establishment, Liberal Party establishment. Mm. Alexander Downer, who is, often appears in you know, the newspapers and wherever, he was an opposition leader and a federal government minister. Um, most people I know, I'm here in Echo Chamber bit, but most people I know, most political analysts I know, um, do not take him seriously. Now, this is a person who is the, you know, the son of a, a son of a politician of a politician. He is so embedded in the establishment, all he ever says is things that agree with the establishment. Mm -hmm. um, that's why his nickname has always been Lord Downer. You know, he acts like it. Mm -hmm. And if the, if if the House of Lords isn't the establishment, you know, I'm not sure what is. <laughs> Not that he's actually a lord, but point is, he has the mindset. The mentality. That's the yeah. establishment. When people talk about, I don't like the establishment, that's what they're, they're really talking about. They're saying, we're being treated differently. You know, we're second class or another class, you know, mm. ruling class, working class. Well, here it's just, you know, he has set himself up above us. Mm. And actually, we don't like that. We don't like any politician that does that. Quite reasonably so. Right? Egalitarian world and all that. Mm -hmm. um, in keeping with the whole Russia-Ukraine conflict, um, mm -hmm. another there's, there's, there's the two arguments of, okay, um, as you mentioned, Russia is, is bad, they're attacking Ukraine, we have to go defend, defend Ukraine and help Ukraine. Um, uh, and Putin wants to recreate the Soviet Union and, and, and all that. Uh, there's the other argument, and I have to admit, I kind of lean towards this side of things, where it's way more complicated than than that. And I would say this conflict could be a little bit of our own creation, our own fault on the West. Um, when the Soviet Union fell, we we basically imposed the shock doctrine of, you know, economics on them. Absolutely. We made things so much more worse for the Russians. Yeah. I mean, they, they talk about Russian collusion with Trump and, and 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 Putin, which turned out not to be true. But we did that during the nineties. Well, nobody's proved it. Let's be clear. Nobody's proved it yet. <laughs> well, well, yeah, but 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 my point being, we there is plenty of proof that America did do that with Yeltsin back in the nineties oh, yeah. election. Yeah. Yep. So we, so there was that there, and then. Um, once Putin came along, uh, he initially wanted to be part of the West. He, he initially wanted to be welcomed and he wanted to be, you know, uh, incorporate Russia into, you know, this new Russia, post-Soviet Union into the world. But it seems to be over the time from the Bush administration uh, all the way up to now, there's been this almost rejection uh, and then this idea of nato keeps on creeping closer they had the buffer zone agreement the method the minsk agreement i believe yes um and uh and slowly slowly nature's getting closer and closer and he still he saw what happened with with uh saddam and and gaddafi and and all them yep. and i i think part of this escalation uh, or this problem today is a lot of the people both in the establishment but even everyday people still have a, almost a cold war mentality they still think russia is communist hmm. you, you know and um uh I, I i i would i would say that um they don't take that part of the story into consideration what i just said 
and also the idea of um, uh, escalation. Like we, this could easily go into uh, Russia. Isn't a isn't Iran? Isn't Iraq? Isn't Libya? This is Russia. This is another America. In in essentially the la- the landmass and the resources and uh, and the Russian people, they're but no, they're. They're different breed of cat. I mean, they're the ones that defeated the Nazi war machine. <laughs> you know, uh, they uh, they can take a lot of hardship. Um, uh, uh, so, I, I think I think the unipolar moment has ended, and now um, America got so used to not having a real adversary or or any resistance. Because, like I said, all the smaller countries they just had no problem getting into. Now they finally come across another a Russia that's off their feet from the early nineties, uh, and they they can push back. And now the whole idea of escalation and World War Three and the nuclear and all that type of stuff, mm-hmm. I think it's not getting into people's heads. They still think Russia is the type of Russia that's either Soviet Union or after the post early nineties and. It's not true anymore. Uh, this whole thing can really get out of control. There's, there's, nah, there's an awful lot to unpack. As you said before, an awful lot to unpack <laughs> in that. Um, yes, I do think people are viewing um, Russia as uh, not the um, timid, broken um, Russia of the Yeltsin period, you know, with a uh, drunken, you know, stupidly dancing president. Um, Keeping in mind that uh, it, it, uh, what's his name, um, Putin started within uh, Yeltsin's circle. Mm. Yeltsin um, was the one who was choosing Putin to be the new guy. Um, Russia at that time, oh, indeed, you know, it's it's been this way for quite some time, uh, was operated by groups of people. You know, so not by a ruling party necessarily. Like this, the Soviet period is something quite separate now from what we've got post uh, the post-Soviet period, particularly after the ten-year break that is the '90s um, gangster capitalism, uh, or you know, we call it mafia capitalism. However, you want to describe what the shock doctrine, etc., of um, what occurred in Russia. And indeed, a number of the former states and stands, um, their economies were wrecked. Uh, their people often end up far worse off. Uh, living standards in um, Russia plummeted. Uh, uh, death rates actually increased. So, a standard of living fell. Um, your health outcomes fell. Everything fell. It's only in the last, you know, well, certainly from about the mid noughties to the mid-teens, so from about 2005 to 2015, you actually saw an increase uh, in all these uh, elements, which was great, all built on oil and gas, mind you, but nonetheless, the economy was going well, Russians started to feel comfortable again, where they hadn't felt for quite some time. Um, Putin got rid of the Yeltsin clan that had been around him and installed his own clan. Mostly people he had previously worked with. So the people closest to him, you know, there was a really good BBC piece about it. But again, Graham Gill actually went through this. Um, the um, Siloviki, those people closest to him, um, which are their own uh, different form of oligarch, because oligarchs have a, a, a particular meaning in the, the Russian sense. But this is the elites that travel with or around um, Putin. Um, they're very hawkish. They think they should be a new Soviet Union. You know, they think they should be in charge. Um, they have a huge pile of nuclear weapons. This is not unlike how many people in the UK think. You know? We were once an empire. In fact, we're still an empire. You know, so mm. Forms of imperial thinking. Um, now, that's not Soviet Union. That's imperialism. So there's an imperial thought there. This is the problem for America, for the UK, something that the French haven't quite got over, but the Germans got over it quickly because they had an empire for a very short period of time. So they weren't really imperial. 
something the Chinese will have to grapple with at some point in the future, particularly now that they have uh, theoretically a dictator for life um, mm. in Xi Jinping. I mean, he may not stick around. He may retire or he may be toppled. He may be pushed on his way. Always possible. Um, Chinese internal politics is always cloaked, uh, opaque. In the, in the, what they call it the other day, the black box of how government actually works. Nonetheless, you know, China's watching very carefully what's going on here. And you're right, the unipolar moment's gone. We are looking at what you might describe as a tripolar moment. Russia reasserting itself has a huge nuclear arsenal, 6,000 odd warheads I read. That's a lot. Uh, um, you have the US nuclear war stockpile, and you have China, which has a whole range of weapons. Uh, they've got their own price, uh, space program. They are every bit the superpower uh, that uh, Russia would like to think it still is. It might not be you know, super superpower, but it's still there. It's still yeah. a great power. Mm -hmm. you know? um, if it's reasserting itself in Ukraine, yes, there's a, as we discussed earlier, the, there's a, an awful lot of um, prehistory that goes with Ukraine and the, the West and the repeated incursions into Russia. Russia has always been seen as a threat to Europeans, um, particularly the Germans, because well, the Germans used to be a lot closer to them. <laughs> they, they did used to have Prussia. Well, they used to have the Baltic coast there through Poland, um, Galicia and the, those areas in Poland. Um, when, or post uh, Second World War, when Poland was essentially just moved towards the West and the creation of Belarus, uh, which is in fact formerly Polish. Mm. Um, so it was that creation that moved everything sideways to give the Soviet Union a buffer to say that Moscow is not so close to everywhere else so that we can keep the West a little bit further away because they keep on trying to have a go at us. That mentality has never changed. Mm. But now you have a more imperial mentality coming through saying we will have our empire again, whether it's recreating the Soviet Union or whether it's just you know, um, the, the, the Russian empire as it was you know, 100 yeah. years ago, yeah. 100, 105 years ago now, yeah, that's 105 years ago. Um, if that's that empire, well, this, that does include Kazakhstan. It includes some of the stands. You know, it includes, include, can include part of Ukraine and Poland and whatever. You know, that's, that's what they see it as. They're taking back Crimea. They're taking back you know, Donetsk and Luhansk. Um, which you know certainly have high proportions of Russian speakers or ethnic Russians. Mm. Um, so all they're doing is partially recreating that. That we don't quite understand that or don't factor it in. Yes, failure. The Minsk Agreement trampled and broken. Absolutely. You know, EU, the sorry, Ukraine saying we want to be members of NATO, we want to be members of this, and that being dangled in front of them. The Baltic states, you know, being you know allowed to be part of Europe, I mean, they essentially always always were treated as that. You know, the 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 Baltic states in Finland have been at various times, certainly in the last 150 years, considered European. But then so was Moscow. You know, when when uh, Russian emperors would hire generals from France or Germany, and they would go and work there. So that says it's part of Russia. You know? Catherine the Great saw it as part of, uh, uh, sorry, part of Europe. Um, part of Russia, part of Europe. Uh, the dividing line, though, is that uh, the Russians are still Russian and the West still sees itself as different. You know? uh, and it seems to see that them as what we want to keep them there. right? And the Russians saying, you keep on trying to get closer. You know, go away. We don't want you as close to us. So yes, there's a lot, a lot to be said for that, um, that particular argument. Um, where this ends up, um, I, I, I fear greatly. Um, if if Putin had been super successful right, uh, in the first three days of his attack, if he'd captured Zelensky in the cabinet in the centre of Kiev, had taken Kharkov. 
uh, and Kherson and Mariupol relatively easily, um, it would all have stopped at this point. Mm. There would be no further bombing because it was meant to be surgical strikes. But the moment that failed was back to standard tactics. And this is the uh, this is the Chechen campaign. We will shell the crap out of it. Right? We will bomb the crap out of it. We'll turn it into rubble, and then we'll send in the bulldozers. Uh, essentially, what after being cashed up by Putin, the Syrian government under Assad did um, to mm. all the, the the rebels as he saw them there, all the all the civil wars, and the, you know the all the different groups, as he bombed the crap out of them, then he sent the bulldozers in, mm. um, and that's just huge loss of life. Uh, that's a brutal total war. Um, uh, you know, Russians have got experience, as I say, in that in Grozny, in uh, Chechnya. That was a horrible war. <laughs> um, but but also, you know, I, I think there's almost a, a, a intergenerational uh, trauma, a memory with the Russians with World War Two. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, that's why they're so protective over that part of Europe. Uh, yeah. um, they, they, and I, I think us in the West, we do not take that, we don't, we don't, we don't recognize it, we don't take that into consideration. Oh. And we go, well, what's the problem? And for them, it's, it's something really <laughs> concerning, to say the very least. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, um, but now I've noticed even, even in Australia and other places too, people who were naturally non-interventionist and they were that during the war on terror and all that stuff mm -hmm. something about russia as soon as something as soon as it's about russia they just switch that part of their brain yeah. off and they oh no we have to go and fight fight russia it's yes. very strange yes. the the selective uh, the selective uh, knowledge or the selective arguments um um, it's strange but, but who, who have you been talking to and what is their ancestry is it european because i bet you it is i bet you it's europeans going we've got to go and fight russia <laughs> oh no no it's some, some australian it's like aussie <laughs> like yeah yeah but like aussies are mostly mostly europeans uh, you know, yeah were you talking to someone who's chinese australian chinese australians and you know, new new migrants from most of asia and for that matter um the middle east um couldn't care less about Russia, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's Europeans care about Russia. Uh, and people with, a, you know, we're, we're part of the Anglosphere. We, we, we get our information from the US and from the UK. You know, we know, we know far more about US politics than the US knows or cares about Australian politics. Yeah. The same with UK yeah. politics. Mm -hmm. So that means... You know, well, where, where's our where's our information, and where's our, where's that uh, set of ideas coming from? It's coming from the US. It's coming from the UK. Russia is the bad guy. Oh, they're the ones with poison. They try to poison people. It's yeah. Like, what yeah. you mean? You mean American and or US and uh, UK and European secret services haven't been poisoning poisoning people in other countries? Ho ho ho! Exactly. Israel with its you know uh, you know Shin Bet and Mossad you know going around killing people. It's like no. Lots of countries do that. Hopefully, uh, the, Australia doesn't, but you never know. Well, that, that reminds me of, uh, of of two things. I remember uh, Trump was being interviewed, and he's going, uh, "Yeah, we, you know, basically he said the quiet part out loud." Oh, yeah. And he said, "Yeah, we, we we do that all the time." Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, why are you so? I mean, grow up. <laughs> yeah, he was being more honest than most politicians. Yeah. Yeah. And and another one is the um, whole idea of Putin's uh, KGB. He's KGB. And, oh, yeah, he was. But remember, George Bush Senior was the director, not just an agent, but the director of the CIA. Hey, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, so the idea of him having some actually, I think a lot of presidents, if we go back in the history, had some sort of intelligence connection in some well, way. In, uh, in Russia, it was it was interesting because you know you, you remember it's the triumvirate that, that it's ruled by the triumvirate, which is between the military, um, the KGB, uh, and the party. The military never got a look in in terms of who got to be a leader. It was always the party and the KGB was mm. making those decisions. Um, no, yes, 
uh, if you look, if you watch the Death of Stalin, which is a very funny movie, um, it's all played up a little bit. Zhukov marching in, and Beria being the black hat, i.e., the KGB being the black hats, and um, uh, Brezhnev and um, Khrushchev being the well, not Khrushchev in particular, uh, from the party being the one who's trying to bring it all together. What you're seeing, though is it's always it's been the party ideologues it's been the ideological program and that which supports it right the the, the kgb which is the one that comes to the forefront it's mm -hmm. not a military leader um you know we have governor generals who are military leaders and we have some ministers who've been in the military right that's fine but we don't have you know major general uh, so and so as you know our prime minister in fact that's quite rare uh, mm -hmm. to see in nearly all the Western democracies. It'll be a party leader or someone who may have been involved in the security services. Um, less so for most Western countries now, mm -hmm. um, but certainly, you know, you'll not see the head of MI5 popping up as, <laughs> as anything because uh, well, they don't need to. But, you know, it's not, it's, it's uh, Andropo, uh, Andropov um, when he became head of uh, when he came general secretary of the Soviet Union, he, he was ex-KGB. He was the former head of the KGB. So mm -hmm. there's certainly, you know, some history there of that being available. And so, you know, yes, you know, the head of the F, uh, head of the KGB or colonel in the KGB ends up as, you know, uh, the ends up in the FSB and then ends up I don't know, plucked by Yeltsin from relative obscurity, you know, uh, into a political position and then has made the heir apparent yeah, okay, that seems reasonable. Uh, no different to how many other people seem to find their way into politics. Yeah, I think a lot of that, once again, I, I think people almost have this naivete about how we do things in the West compared to Russia oh, yeah. or other places. Um, there are some differences. I mean, we do yeah, generally yeah. have political parties and elections, whereas they have very few political parties. It really is much more like a clan system. Mm. You know, so uh, it's the, the parties themselves tend not to be democratic. So, you know, uh, Mother Russia, Mother Russia is not, or well, the Motherland Party is not democratic. I forget that for a start, <laughs> you know. Uh, but neither is most of the others. Most of them are, you know, not oligarchs, but they're, or they're part of the elite structures uh, and they have certain power within their own party. They tend to be chauvinistic and hierarchical. Yeah, okay. That's different to how our parties are now. Go back 50 years, oh yeah, you know, our parties were just as hierarchical and, and you know, male bastions of male chauvinism. So, absolutely. Um, democracies do operate differently, though, to um, non democracies, i.e., dictatorships or authoritarian regimes. So, we actually can't compare the two. It would be, um, and saples and pairs, it would just be a uh, bad comparison. Um, we think, though, you're quite right about thinking about um, the Soviet, sorry, the Soviet Union, thinking about Russia as a Soviet Union, hmm. or, well, that's what that's that is in part how we think about it. Um, we've forgotten, and I come back, I've come back to this, um, that they see themselves more as an imperial power, hmm. you know, recreating the empire, which is kind of what the Soviet Union was. But the Soviet Union had a very clear ideology, um, apart from. You know, I'm right, and uh, security services are important, and we'll use the military on you if you're not careful. Uh, in Greater Russia, there's no ideology behind Putin. That's power, right? And if that's the ideology, fine. You know, um, with Putinism, um, I, I think this is my my perception, at least my uh, analysis. To understand Putinism, you have to kind of understand Alexander Solzhenitsyn. I mean, when the Soviet Union fell, he wrote a book called, called Rebuilding Russia. Hmm. And if you, and it basically it was his like, recommendations of what kind of Russia should we now have. Hmm. And quite, not, if not all of them, but quite a few of them, Putin has basically implemented. Hmm. Like, um, uh taking the religion and, br and bringing it back up again mm -hmm. now you got yep. the orthodox christian as the state religion uh you uh, 
being very much nationalistic as opposed you know as opposed to being you know the whole soviet non-nationism with all yep. soviet yep. type of thinking or internationalism actually but yeah uh, yeah yeah um uh there's that one there's that one and you it was a few other ones which escaped my mind and and i i i've for de- for a while now i always said putin needs almost like a throwback to the czar <laughs> like he's not yeah, so well that, that's right he's not so but in the that. absence of ideology he's then reclaimed um uh, a set of imperial ideas or ideas that would not be out of place in an in imperial russia right okay well yeah. hmm. um but uh, keeping with europe though um moving away from russia and, and the conflict there um uh there seems to be also a lot of populist movements happening in in but, yeah. in yeah. uh continental Europe. I mean, there's the Five Star and the Lega in Italy and the mm-hmm. Brothers of Italy, uh, Forum for Democracy in the Netherlands, uh, and more notably with the election coming up, uh, Le Pen and uh, Zemmour uh, yes. are, are going in France. Uh, um, well, the- Le Pen's linked to a much older movement there, uh, yeah. which is, was a much older right-wing nationalist movement. Um, but yes, yes, you're right. And then the, the, can't forget, you know, uh, AFD in Germany. Yeah. Um, you know, there's there's been a variety. Most of them have uh, similarities. Uh, I was going to say Yellow Jackets uh, in um, France as well, which is a more spontaneous movement um, mm-hmm. as opposed to, you know, more organised movements. AFD was quite organised. Um, mm-hmm. There were, was it Pegida? There was an mm-hmm. earlier yeah, movement. Yeah that was uh, less organized, um, but they're more spontaneous movements. Um, they're the interesting ones. M5S, wow. M5S is fascinating um, as a constructed movement. Oh, five star movement. Now, sorry, it was constructed. Right? It was star. intentional. Yes, five star. Uh-huh, uh-huh. It was allowed to be amorphous at the early stages, but it was constructed. It was started by, it was two people who set it up, um, set up the mechanisms, uh, you know, have that Beppo Grillo, who, you know, television star, comedian again. Ha, ha, ha. Something about comedians. Mm-hmm. Um, and Castle uh, Hedger as well. He yeah. was more like the, yes. the mind. He's the, he's, the, he's the mind. He's the mind behind it. And, and Beppo Grillo was more like the face. Yes. And he was like the driving force. Yeah. Um, but there you match a, a populist, right, with someone who's got an idea about how to create mechanism. So it's a constructed movement. Not a pop, not not a, your standard um, spontaneous movement. Yellow Jackets is much more spontaneous. Um, if you you know, you can, there's a bunch of anarchist movements in out that came out of Italy that were much more spontaneous. Black Bloc was was a was as Black Bloc a creation, but that's a bunch of anarchists. Um, the the whole Freedom Convoy stuff uh, is in one sense created, but it's got so many different travelers it's much more spontaneous um than uh, i think we realize it's it's not it's not a oh it's the same old bunch of right-wing nutters it's like no no there's a whole bunch of different people who've, who've not just climbed on the bandwagon this is there's, there's these different groups and they've made new connections and mm-hmm. you know they don't they don't agree other than they don't like the government that's what they agree on um yellow jackets has operated in the same way and so they've been able to put pressure on government some of the others, though, are more organized, and that's what they've become. It's far more organized. But, but um, it, so isn't that a natural progression, though? Like you start as a movement, and then eventually you enter politics, so you have to at least get organized. Like the idea of the five star being constructed, isn't that not really anything new where you have this populist feeling, but to get organized you have to construct a party you have to get into politics there was a bunch of a bunch i'll give you an example there was a bunch of student movements in the u.s uh in the late 60s and into the early 70s sds and sns now they were very powerful in that they were able to organize um as a bunch of disparate groups of people um spontaneous organizations erupting in different universities across america they could put on marches and indeed, you know, do do the Portland thing, essentially take over parts of city, not unlike Occupy. But the moment you tried to form it into an organization, 
the whole thing fell apart. The whole point of it was that they were able to be spontaneous, to act spontaneously. Occupy worked because it was spontaneous. Ramachi tried to organize it into the Occupy party. We'll say, well, I wasn't interested in a party. You know, the point is this this is not about being organized to take take control, take power, but it to express opposition to how things have been going. And we don't have, you know, Occupy didn't have one set of simple demands because mm -hmm. it couldn't. It was too many different demands. Mm -hmm. um, so the Freedom Convoy can't have one simple set of demands that government can then deal with and can then talk to. It has a whole lot of, in fact, times contradictory demands. Uh, uh, the moment you try and organise it, that's, it'll start to dissipate because people will go, well, you haven't taken care of my demand or I was here because I hit the government or so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Spontaneous movements are really interesting. Um, because they can create new organizations, but more likely they won't create organizations, or those organizations will exist between times. Peace, peace movements are a classic for this. They'll erupt. You know, 2003, the uh, anti Iraq invasion marches got millions of people onto the streets around the world, well, tens of millions. You know, there was how many in, in Sydney? A quarter of a million. But unheard of. I mean, Hyde Park was literally a wash with people. It was jam packed, wall to wall people, a lot of people. Um, try and organize them. No, suppose all that energy just somehow, you know, where did it all go? They so, said, well, people needed to express how they felt. They came out, they expressed it, but you can't actually try and organize them because they're expressing different things in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, you know, on opposition to war in general, on opposition to this particular attack, um, uh, an opposition to US imperialism or Australian involvement overseas, I mean, all of these different things. You know, um, the organized movement's been successful. M5S, as I said, constructed, it was allowed to then develop. Um, that's Again, what makes it interesting is that it was then allowed to have lots of people engaged and involved, still uh, at least partly controlled from the centre. That's all been that was then slowly removed as the party started to grow and take take on well, seats, win seats. Well, well, well um, in my observation of the Five Star Movement, uh, it started off well enough. It got build a momentum he got set to win offices and and, and local level there for a for outside movement they went pretty well in 2018 they became the coalition government with the uh, with another populist uh mm. uh party the the savini's lega and um but i think the last they're losing a lot of support nowadays because they've basically sold out to the very establishment that we're supposed to well, rebel against. Liga um, Lord, though, has been around for years and is part of the establishment. It's been around for quite some yeah. time. It's popular, Liga Nord, um, the Northern League has been around, oh, oh, Liga, yeah. Savini and so on. It's been around for quite some time. But it's Savini, established. But Savini's it, it's, Liga it's, is it's different oh, from yeah. the regional. Oh, yeah, I agree. But it's populist in its uh, nature. It's less of a movement and more a populist party. Yeah. Whereas uh, you know, um, M5S is actually more uh, a movement and less of a party. And when you try to make the party out of it, you see defections. You see, you know, uh, mayors of this or the MPs going off and doing other things, saying, that's not what I joined. And mm. I joined this other more vibrant blah, 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 blah thing. So people then rejecting it. And yes, their votes collapse, essentially. And they will dissipate um over time um i think the, the nature of italian politics is that there'll be yeah. another five different started. parties you know, <laughs> it's you a mess know. yeah it, but you know that's that is literally the nature of italian politics i think people have to get used to the idea there's always going to be lots of little parties lots of little connections that's fine you know as long as you can actually have a function government of some level mm. um and it always used to be the 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 joke uh, that uh, you had an election, you have 500 parties and the economy got stronger. You try to cut it down so you had one party in charge and the economy fell apart. 
Right. Uh, perhaps if you, you left the left it to work away and they got the basics done, mm. then yes, the economy does well. But when you have, uh, you know, this was part of the argument. You put you put uh, ideological parties in charge. Ah, uh, that's when things start going wrong. Maybe, maybe not. Um, it hasn't worked that way in other countries. You know, um, I think it's got much more to do with uh, the Italian politics and the structure of Italian politics and mm -hmm. the divisions within it between north and south, between country well, and city. city. Well, Italy. Uh, that's the most frustrating thing about Italy. Uh, if they can get the politics together, Italy will be seen as a much more powerful country than what it is. It really is, but people overlook it. I mean, yeah. in the EU, people just say, oh, Germany and France, but Italy is the third major party uh, country there. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, the Treaty of Rome was yeah. signed. Oh, uh, but, the economy... but keep in mind, though, the EU was set up for a very specific reason, which was to stop you, France and Germany fighting. Yeah. And it was to corral them, you know. True, true. But, but my point being, Italy's like, usually gets seen as the idiot cousin. Yes, that's you right. Know? Yeah. And um, the economy is very, the, the amount of innovation that comes out of Italy, I, I saw a list the other day, even I was surprised. And that's yeah. my background. They Quite a lot of innovation coming up that, out of there. Quite oh. a lot of, the economy, despite all the problems, it's still quite up there. It's still a member of the yeah. G, the G uh, seven. They're still, I mean, and that's with their it, uh, their politics uh, being a mess. If they can just get the politics done right, everything it will be such an elevation for them. Oh, but that, I but I wonder, really, Daniel. I actually think really it's the other way around. That one thing. Uh, and I, I I think the politics is it's the nature of Italian politics. You know, it's. You know, you go to Germany and it's very ordered and somber and boring, right? Um, <laughs> you know, you go to Italy and it's all over the place, but things get done all the same. And indeed, the economy, I mean, the economy was, I remember the, I remember seeing the rankings and going, it's actually got a huge economy. <laughs> and we shouldn't ever discount Italy as a, an economic power. And yes, it totally is a, a highly innovative um, country, always has been. Um, it's it's why it considered itself you know, an imperial power, a world power. You know, certainly in the 30s, uh, it, its politics went a little bit screwy at the time. But hey, you know, every country has its foibles. <laughs> yeah, to say the least. To say the least. Yeah. Um, but with Italy, I think it was the 70s and maybe 80s. It was probably at its most stable, at its most yes. post, post World War, at least. It was probably that's the high point for Italy. Uh, I think Kratzi was the last like stable prime minister, the leader that the country had. As bad as he was in the end, he, yes. he went. He so went in, deeply corrupt. He, yeah, he went into exile and corrupt and and all yeah. that. But as the functioning of a country, he was still very stable and going very oh, yeah. well. After him, as bad as he was, I don't think Italy ever really. Recovered well, that, the, the inter interestingly, level. it slipped into either um, you know, technocratic leadership or populism, um, mm. and that's the way it seems to have gone. I mean, uh, the the huh, who've you had? You know, oh, Berlusconi, <laughs> Dra Draghi, and a few others. But yeah. yes, Berlusconi. Berlusconi's mentor was Craxi. Yeah. Know? So, you know, Berlusconi learnt from the best, as it were, um, or the worst, depending on how you look at it. Yeah. Um, but he was populist, very populist. Mm. No, Grio and Salvini are populists, right? Um, you know, this isn't the, the, the dour Christian Democrats, right? This isn't the, you know, somewhat radical, but actually deeply establishment communists. Mm. Right? Or the PD these days, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, you know, Italian politics being what it is. Um, you're right, though. Italy is a, a highly innovative, large, economically um, country that has an interesting politics that actually still functions. It's still a democratic nation. It hasn't fallen into you know, some form of dictatorship again, and it doesn't look like it's even likely to. People might say, oh, you're a bunch of fascists. You let you know, Alessandro Mussolini is. So what? 
It happens. It happens. You know, no country's yeah. perfect. Um, but no, but, uh, yeah. you know, but but also, you know, like she gets between one and three percent. Who cares? You know, she's not getting fifty percent or even thirty percent of the vote. No, she's getting mm. nothing. You know, which tells you the support isn't there. You couldn't run a country with that. You know? mm -hmm. Um, keeping with uh, Europe, uh, with the upcoming French election, what's your observations about what's happening there? Oh. I'll end up with Macron again because no one else is able to tip him out um, because they won't. They can't. Um, they can't go to the the, the right. The, the left will get together to, to keep the right out. But you know, Melenchon's you know passed it was. Oh, did um, what's her name? Hidalgo, Hidalgo um, from PS is polling what six percent? You know, poor Will. You know, this is nothing. Macron's the only person who's out there whose party is leading. He'll be in the second round. You know, um, he will end up with Macron again because who else are you going to vote for? Uh, that's the that's the real issue. What happens in the uh, National Assembly later on? Well, that's a different kettle of fish. Um, that's when you can see different alliances appear, and that's when I think Macron's party might. Well, it will take some huge hits, um, but that's happened before. You know, we've had presidents and prime ministers have been from different parties. Um, but it's amazing that Macron, uh, he's been polling very low for most of the five years. You had the yellow he's still jacket. still polling 25%. He's still polling 25%, and that's all you need. Or, or, if yeah. nobody else is getting it, then you're still the top dog. Because yeah. remember, it's a, that two-round system. It's not, you know, it's not an alternative vote. It's not proportional representation. It's, you know, it's a two-round system. And then you get more than 12.5% of the total population, total vote voting for you. Um, so it's not 12.5% of the votes cast, 12.5% of the total uh, electors. Um, he'll get 20, 25% and he's in. And then it's a case of, so who's the challenger? Who's the other one, right, that's, that's going to get over that, uh, that mark? Who else is going to get 20%? Um, and it's like, well, this, I go, what options do you have? You know? well, well, you know, obviously the two in contention for the yes. for the challenger is going to be Zamor or Le Pen. Yes. And they're both about 17, 15 yes. percent, like, essentially neck and neck. Yeah. And, you know, eventually one of them is going to fall. And there's so many similarities in their supporters. Yeah. You know, whoever is going to win, their their support is going to just gravitate towards them. So, and my calculation, it'll be maybe just enough to be a little bit above Macron. Yeah, I mean could, that doesn't matter. That actually your, doesn't matter. But you could know, I that, win win at all? Either Le Pen or, or Zemmour in the end? I don't think either of those two. I mean, you don't have I don't, think, I, I don't think I don't think Le Pen can. Can win. I think Le Pen has got too much baggage. Um, that uh, doesn't uh, rule out another right challenger. Well, I think Le Pen's niece just recently came out and supported publicly Zemmour, which is uh, uh, yeah. a big news <laughs> in French politics. Um, do you think it will be Zemmour versus Macron? Could be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. If I was going to pick one, that's probably where I go. But you know, if, if that means we end up with that's the final two, then I think I still think Macron could Macron should win that. Whether would he it, does, you know, would it be a question. would it be a close battle though? They're always close battles. The left and the right they line up really nicely. You know? they really do. Um, every oh, now wow. and then it's an overwhelming one, but you know that's usually because your challenge is crap. You know. Well, I, I think I think Macron soundly beat Le Pen in the in the final round last election. Well, yes, sound, soundly, but nonetheless, you know, there's, there's uh, she had a hell of a good vote for someone from far right. <laughs> yeah, 
but 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 that's changed even since then. If yeah. in the yeah. five five years, it's been yes, yeah. the yellow jacket movements, the people very angry with Macron yep. before he was a fresh unknown face. Yep. Now we know him. Uh and um there's so many things that happened and Zamor seems to be trying to pull a Trump in being this outsider businessman type. Yep. Um did they have a shot of actually pulling up an upset? Oh, you know. Um, I think that's what, well, that's what everybody thought Le Pen would do last time. Um, uh, that's right. Um, so but, anyway, everybody thought but that, Mac that. But Macron was still unknown at the time. Now we know him. So would that hurt him more? I'm just trying to put my phone away. Uh, I think the baggage that he's picked up over the last five years, yeah, that's, that's real. Um, he has to overcome that. I can't help feeling though. Sometimes the the baggage you pick up is actually from uh, the people who aren't your supporters. I.e., you know, were Yellow Jackets ever going to vote for you? Well, you know, it's like it's like why does you know, um, Scott Morrison not care when people go out and protest about immigration like that we should have you know free the refugees or climate change because he's going they're not going to vote for me anyway. Right. You know, there's mm. the calculation that's going on. Um, that that machine politics will say they're not our voters. We're not trying to get them. You know, right. we aim at this other group. You know, so Macron can try and be the the, the global leader, sh shuttle diplomacy. You know, still trying to get Putin to pull back. Uh, and at the end of the day, if you pull that off, everybody say a French leader. No, right. brought world peace uh, right? people, huh? yeah yeah mm. uh even if he doesn't you know he's put up a good show as a, as a true european uh, mm. someone who's tried to bring peace uh -huh. um that helps yeah it does yeah so mm. um most of the problems for um uh macron are not necessarily of his making. Mm -hmm. They're compounding problems from pre previous from Holland and, and others, um, like Libya, you know, and the spillover from Libya, mm -hmm. a spillover from intervention in Libya, you know, a spillover from Tunisia, uh, unrest in Algeria. So all these things have spillovers. So you have thousands of people trying to get through, um, tens of thousands of people trying to get through. You know, it's, it's what Spain faces every time it annoys, you know, um, Mohammed of Morocco is, you know, oh, 20,000 people turn up at the borders of Suata and Melilla, right, trying to get in, and they do. You know, they're, they're quite successful. And so that Spain is stuck taking more refugees. So the refugee crisis, which affects actually Italy the worst, Italy mm. and Greece, um, is also propelled and promoted by actions they've taken in the past, you know, mm. that are then sweeping up. So Alger uh, Algeria is not a, you know, a problem for what they did in the 50s. It's what's what happened in 2011, you know, yeah. the Arab Spring. So there's still, you know, there's still all this stuff still happening in the background. Um, and that drives, you know, 10,000 people sitting in Calais wanting to get across to the UK. You know, um, therein lies a problem and you know it's in part where yellow jacket started from and so it then comes down into paris so it's like what about subsidies we want to continue to have what about subsidies they're subsidies after all yeah. come on guys but you know it's what drives well, I'll give you another example um huge rallies in indonesia uh against jokowi why he tried to reduce the fuel subsidy right and people went, wow, fuel's going to be so expensive. It's like, it's still a subsidy, guys. <laughs> it's right. like you're getting something for free. <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, it's where they get a bit too uh, used to it. So That's right. That's basically it, you know. Yeah. Um, you guys are all on welfare. Hey, I'm not on welfare. So, well, your fuel's subsidized. Right. And, <laughs> and for French farmers, it's, well, your farm produce is, is um, there. Now, it may not be bad, a bad thing. Protectionism has, has been used by politicians and governments for you know, a gazillion years and many still use it mm -hmm. very effectively you know, to protect produce or production um, 
not when it's wasteful. That's that's a bad thing. Although you know the, the propping up the Chinese government does of all its various industries, you know, building industry, steel industry, whatever, you know, to keep the mills turning, to keep people in work, to keep the economy generating. At some point, you start to run into problems with money, you know? mm -hmm. and that's where you know every French president runs into a slight problem with money because you know you're giving it out all over the place, or you've got to give it to the EU. And it's like, oh crap, you know, there's three, you know, 300 million you know, um, euros right. going away. It's like, oh, hang on a sec, do I have that? <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Britain's complaint, you know, all that money we're giving to the EU, we could spend here. Right. Which, of course, they didn't do. You know, I said, oh, we'll have put an extra 300 million a week into NHS, except they never did. Right. But if they had, um, one, the pandemic might not have been quite as nasty as it was in the UK. Mm -hmm. Two, People would love you, you know, right? They don't love well, 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 Boris. Yeah, well, either that more of a failure of the internal politics as opposed to uh, pulling out, pulling the promises was sound, but it just wasn't implemented. Yes and no. I mean, was the was the promise sound um, when you disentangle yourself from a huge trading block that you were once part of and had the benefits of being part of? Um, you know, yes, you gain the the uh, amorphousness of sovereignty, whatever that actually means, because they were still a sovereign nation. It's like, mm -hmm. well, we got our sovereignty back. So you never lost it. It was still England, you know. You still had your own laws. Oh, yes, you'd agreed to be part of supernatural, supernatural, supernational, um, supranational laws or lawmaking, mm -hmm. which you had a veto in. <laughs> you could always say no. Right. That's the thing that's always forgotten. So now there's a veto. There's vetoes for things, you know. Um, Denmark held out for years on uh, Maastricht. So you know, um, it's entirely possible to say no. We don't. We don't agree with that. We don't agree with all these provisions. We have to be part of it. In fact, Britain had been part of, you know, constructing the the, the EU. Big hand in making things change. Mm -hmm. um, which is often forgotten by Brexit campaigners. That said, Brexit campaigners didn't think they were going to win. You know, it was part of a political movement to gain, you know, political uh, power, but not necessarily to win. Winning then means you have to implement. Implementation is hard, well, really uh, hard. That's the whole thing with Johnson, in my opinion. Uh, I think he ran last minute on being a Brexiteer. He I think he did it with the idea that he would lose the the referendum, yeah. but, but he will be seen as the champion of your skepticism mm. within the within the Tory party. Yeah. And when he challenge, and it was only a matter of time when he goes to the leadership, he could he could rally all the your skeptics yep. with him, but and say, oh, I we didn't win it, but I put a neck out. And I'm yep. one of you, uh, and I'd also kill or shoot the UKIP fox at the time. You yes, know? that's right, exactly uh, right. And, um, and then, um, then he uh, he was so shocked when the when the results came in, and they actually won. And now mm -hmm. he's like, "Oh, damn! I'm going to have to do it." That's right. Uh, uh, and um, uh, that's why I think. Um, even now, he's kind of dragging the feet and doing a little bit of this. They're doing almost doing the bare minimum. Compared well, I mean, to they've done what Theresa they can. May. Yeah. Um, compared to Theresa May, he, he do, he, he's done a lot, but um, still not to what the Brexit T types would have wanted. Um, well, the, the, the problem remains, though, that, you know, the, 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 if the Brexit Tears wanted Britain of the 19th century, you can't have that. Uh, that was the 19th century to start with. Um, international law, trade barriers, all, the, the, the whole infrastructure of international law, the superstructure of international law has changed. Trading patterns have changed. The ability to build and run an empire has changed. There is no empire, you know. <laughs> so all the factors that made, you know, sovereign Britain, you know, the John Bull Britain great, Right? They don't exist. They're just not there. Mm -hmm. So you've got to create a different kind of Britain. 
You, know, you mm. can't recreate all the old industries. Oh, we were, you know, we used to make steel. It's like, yeah, you had iron and coal, right? But you can't use coal. You can't mine coal and burn it because that creates another problem, right? Your, your shitty weather gets even shittier, <laughs> right? Um, you know, climate change. I mean, the Tories have accepted mostly, you know, that yes, climate change is happening. You know, um, that some of them are still not on board, but most of them are. Most of them recognise as a problem. And mm. in fact, they've, they've switched off coal. They've stopped mining the stuff. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to recreate the old industries. They're just not there to create. Mm -hmm. You can't recreate the fishing industries that you once had. The fish aren't there. They've been fished out. Mm -hmm. So you, you run into resource problems. So you have to then try and be creative around, you know, what are the new industries that, that the UK can be in? Oh, well, the city will keep us up. Well, that's fine for the city, for London. Mm. Oh, what about Sheffield, Manchester? Oh, what about all the other cities in England? You know, Nottingham or Leeds, you know, or, you know, Newcastle, Durham. What do they do? Oh, well, does everybody just have to look at London? Well, that's the thing about, the fascinating thing about Brexit is that London didn't vote for it. Uh, London was really happy to be part of Europe because mm. so it works for everybody in London. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, and yet here we are saying, well, perhaps we need to look to London to, to get us out of this. It's like, guys, <laughs> they, knew what, they knew where this was going. They knew it was not going to be easy. And it's still not easy. And you're going to have to pay more for stuff. And your supply chains don't work. And you can't get the driver and blah, 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 blah. You know, there's, again, all these compounding factors, which... Is the hard part of public policy. Uh, I'll put on my other hat. You know, it's the hard part of public policy is implementation. Right? You, you get up with all the. It's the same with war. You know the thing about the, uh, you know the best the best plans don't survive first contact with the enemy. You know, right. That's uh, the same for, for a lot of public policy. But but uh, having said that, the last election we had the crumbling of the of the red wall. I mean, massive working class vote went towards uh, Johnson. Um, uh, you know, landslide victory. Uh, they, they say that UKIP and the Brexit Party was like the uh, the the gateway drug <laughs> for partisan votes. You know, they they couldn't bring themselves to vote Tory, but they could bring themselves to vote Farage, and then maybe eventually vote Tory if they have to. And I think that's what happened in, in the last election. Coming up with the next election coming up already, um, what do you see what's happening in, in, in Britain? Uh, there's a lot of the old old Labour Red Wall vote uh, saying they're so disenchanted with Johnson, uh, they might actually go Reform UK or or some other minor vote. It's fine. Do you see that happen? Remember, it's first past the post. It's a first past the post system. Wandering, you know, if half your vote wanders off, you know, to and you and you're, you've got fifty percent, and half your vote wanders off to vote for someone else, right? It usually means that that you know, the Conservative Party. It usually means the Labor Party is going to win. All right. You know, that's mm -hmm. what it means. First past the post is one of those systems that. Uh, that if you've got to be strategic in your voting, or if you're just dis disaffected, you might go, why would I bother voting for a minor party? I might as well just stay home, right? right. It's the same thing, right? Uh, That's uh, the biggest problem is turnout. It's what they, this is about US politics as much as anything else, you know? Turnout is king. Why will the Republicans win back the Senate and the, the House of Representatives? Turn out. Republicans will turn out in midterms. Democrats stay home. Mm -hmm. you know? The same well, thing will happen in the UK. Well, if, uh, I think it was a 2015 election. You had UKIP getting, what, 12%, 15% of the vote mm -hmm. and, what, two two seats. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and um, is, that, is that electric system at all fair? Uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, the reason why they Farage could win two European election, which was national elections, was mm -hmm. because of the uh, the system. Uh, the, the it mixed, it's a, essentially a, it's a kind of a mixed member proportional, yeah, um, kind of. It's got a, it's a slightly different, a slight variation on. It. But yes, it's a mixed member proportional system. Um, yes, that makes a huge difference. Should the UK adopt PR 
Well, people voted against it. You know? They didn't want it. Including you know? the Liberal Democrats, which were for it before they managed to get into coalition right. government. So, so uh, you know, hmm. and they didn't have to have a referendum. They could have just changed the system. You know? hmm. um, but winner takes all and a simple system is what people always go, oh, but it's a simple system. I say, you're right, but it produces stupid results. You know? Mm -hmm. um, there's a, the, and there, there are great examples of, of just how insane the result can be, um, where I think it was the uh, Liberal Party, well, Liberal Party in um, Canada, and British Columbia, won, uh, I think it was 51% of the vote. Uh, they won 72 of 75 seats, right? That's, you go, but they won the vote. So, yeah, but the number of seats they got is entirely disproportionate. Entirely disproportionate. Um, it makes a mockery, in fact, of the system. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, there was one recently I saw um, where the leading party is got 50% and the next party got 25% and got no seats. Uh, the, the leading party won all the seats. That's first past the post. A proportional system would say, yes, but not everybody voted for them. I mean, yes, they got 50% of the vote. Yes, they should get 50% of the seats. Of course they should. They got 50% of the vote. But 50%, what if it had been 49, right, and they still got all the seats? Right? Well, 49% is not a majority. Everybody else might have been voting against you. Mm -hmm. Ah, but, you know, simple system, you know. Yeah, it's a dodgy system. First past the post is, you know, a, a crock when it comes to that. Mm -hmm. um, it, means, that it means that... Uh, you know, we've seen it that, you know, the person who comes second can win here in Australia um, because the majority of people don't want the person that was coming first. All their supporters do, but everybody else is going, we don't want that person. Mm -hmm. right? uh, it's why people end up voting strategically. Mm -hmm. It's why the Liberal Democrats can have, you know, 19 or 20 seats or, you know, 10% of the vote or less. You know, it's because people are voting strategically in particular seats. Uh, why the Greens have one seat, but that seat they hold with 50% of the vote. That's because people keep voting. They go, ah, this one's the one I want. I'll, now I've got them there. We can keep them there. It's Labor or a Green, doesn't really matter, but it's not a Tory. Right. And I'm not going to wander off in case we get the Tory. Right. Um, with with Australia, with the Australian system, we, we still got that system but with the senate seems to be more is it a different system for the senate they seem to be absolutely easier it's, uh, minor, it's, minor parties to get into the senate than it's uh, proportional the preferential so yes minor parties have an option to six senators or uh, when you have a double dissolution you have all 12 go at a time and we probably need at some point to expand the senate um but we're governed by the constitution uh, it's the, the what's it called it's called the nexus rule the number of uh, senators is half the number of House of Representatives. Um, so every time you come to playing with the numbers, you're going, okay, we've got six states. So if we want to, that's the six original states that are the important ones. Um, if we want any more senators, we've got to add six people to the um, House, to, yeah, to the House. Uh, that means paying six more parliamentarians. Will people buy having six more parliamentarians? Oh, we're overgoverned, da da da. Actually, we could probably do with some more parliamentarians um, to increase the gene pool, you know? It's like state politics, you know? You look at sometimes at state politics going, blimey, you know? There's, there's, <laughs> they've got a small gene pool here sometimes. Tasmania, you know, every time a minister resigns, it's like, you know, God, you know, particularly if it's a competent minister, you're going, well, who else is going to be, you know, the leader? Uh, mm -hmm. Most times, everybody has a portfolio. You know? They're all ministers because there's not enough of them. It's only 25. That's just not enough. And a, therefore, majority is 13. You normally have 13 ministries. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but uh, as you mentioned, the United States, um, turning our attention towards them, with the uh, with the upcoming midterm elections and and the recent uh, CPAC event and and everything like that, it seems to be that Trumpism hasn't really gone away. 
do you yet. do you think that um, it's going to have um, is it here to stay? And what's your prediction of what's going to be happening in American oh. politics? Oh, it's here. It's here to stay at least for you know the next um, two and a half years. You know, Trump will run again. Um, I think Trump will probably get the nomination again. Uh, he could even be the president again. At some point, he's going to get too old. And his health is not brilliant. Everybody can, you know, was worried about Biden. His health is way better than Trump's. Um, so I'd be thinking that Trump's actually probably not not going to last more than another term. Mm-hmm. And there is a question if he actually starts to genuinely lose it, do a Ronnie, uh, Ronald Reagan, and start to actually lose it during the presidency, there could well be a move to say that he's formally you know, lost the plot. Will Trumpism survive uh, Donald Trump? I don't think so. I think it's very much built uh, and it's wrapped up in the personality of Donald Trump mm-hmm. um, and the way that he's he's been quite capricious in, in his policy agenda in terms of his decision making if you tried to structure that um, there would be very quickly I think you'd be describing a different party to what you know a Trump Republican party looks like uh, I suspect that the party you would then be talking about would be something closer to uh well, it wouldn't be neo-Nazi, but it would be starting to drift off the, the scale on the right um, and would be suffocating for much of America. It could lead to the breakup of the United States. Mm-hmm. You know, it just takes California to go, actually, we're fed up, right? And we're going we're gonna to leave. Uh, and you want to try and, you know, take us on? Or Texas. <laughs> well, it's the same point. Same point. Mm. But Texas would stay. But California yeah. could leave. Yeah. And California would take, you know, Washington, Oregon, and quite likely Nevada and Colorado with it. Because they're so reliant energy-wise on California. Mm-hmm. Um, so that would make an enormous difference. The moment California says that is the moment that, you know, US politics um, does an internal backflip they won't say you can't. And California will just say, "We'll put up signs." You know, it's the, the country of California. Mm-hmm. Right? We're a separate country. We're not paying federal taxes. You can all bugger off. By the way, take the ships and buck piss off. Mm-hmm. You know? um, or we'll invade. It's like, all right, National Guard just got pulled up. It's a hell of a big National Guard, <laughs> right? Because it's a huge state, a huge mm-hmm. population. Yeah. Uh, this isn't Vermont, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, <laughs> Uh, but, but, but with Trump, uh, well, besides the man and his flaws and his character and, and all that, but I I saw Trumpism or his, his agenda, I saw it quite a lot with the paleo-preservative m- movement of the old right. He, he was an economic nationalist. He leaned towards non-interventionism. It, uh, it was more nationalistic as in America first type of yep. ideas um, it uh, it it was it was populist uh, but and I think the Republican Party used to be the populist <laughs> populist party back in the day too uh, it, uh, the working class has now w- went from Democrats to to the Republicans now um, so Looking what ahead, class. What working class, though? Well, well, a whole lot of working people still voted for Biden. An awful lot. In fact, your biggest switch was in the above the working class. It's the lower middle class. They were doing okay. Right? They're the biggest switches in terms of actual people who voted one way, who's then switched to the other side. Mm-hmm. The issue. Because there isn't such a big working class. We don't have huge factories, you know, per- churning out materials. They're highly automated these days. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't have, you know, uh, a million coal miners because the coal mines are shut. So, you know, yeah, and what's left? Well, they chop the top off a mountain and then just dig it up, right? Uh, it's none right. of this underground stuff. So 
the, the nature of what this working class has shifted in the United States. So mm. this, there's a there's a whole debate around the nature of class uh, and class voting, what that actually what it actually looks like. Um, yeah. So I'd say it's, it's it's a different thing. The issue with uh, Trump is his <laughs> his capriciousness. Sorry, but Liam, I, I, your, your point is well made. No, I'll, I'll just continue. Your point is well made about. Let me finish. Yeah. The point is well made about. Um, uh, you know, the, being a paleo-conservative or just con a highly conservative, non-interventionist, nationalistic, America first. Yes. And that's what people thought he would be in that first term. And mm. in the first six months, you know, and, and indeed, in, in fact, right to the end of the term, he was still very much the, yes, we'll pull our troops out of this place or we'll pull our troops out of this that place. So he says we're going to leave... Um, uh, Afghanistan and leaves Biden to pick up the pieces when it goes pear shaped. You know, that's a nice little you know Easter egg to leave people, but that's what they said they'd do, and that's what happened. Uh, and he said he would keep doing that, except that it didn't always happen that way. And he always rewarded you know the right people. So people who worked for him made shed loads of money. Mm. So it becomes a, a, a graft machine. Mm. Right? People happily give money. Uh, that's the old thing about, you know, uh, it's not, was it? I've forgotten the line about it. it's nothing easier than uh, separating a fool from his money. Right? But, you know, it's along the lines of the, the grifts, the, all the stuff that happens to extract money from people or to hand it to the next billionaire, which has happened enormously. Um, I don't think that's conservative politics. Right? That's something else. That's the grift. And there's been presidents like that before, right? There's been some terrible ones before. I've been good, quite a good president, but deeply um, corrupt. Uh, Andrew Jackson was always said to be a bit like that. No, you know, old old Hickory. Yeah, mm. but also there's a certain amount of corruption happening as well. Trump's ability to speak to a crowd and whip up a crowd. Now, it doesn't exist for most other um, American mm. politicians. It's a real uh, gift he has. He can be unintelligible, but the right words being said, you know, in roughly the right order, they go, yeah, you know, You're going, what's going on there? Something quite different is going on. He's speaking back to them how they would react and speak. Mm -hmm. uh, Ted Cruz can't do it, right? Mm. It just isn't. <laughs> Ted Cruz is not a popular politician. Right. No, even even within the Republican Party. That's yeah. right. Yeah, he's just not not popular. It's not even, barely. He almost lost in Texas. You know. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> you uh, to be doing, yeah. To be yeah. You've got to be doing badly. Um, there are very few uh, populist politicians of the cut of, of Trump. Um, you know, there are very few populist politicians of, of the, the the cut of you know not Salvini, but of. Putin at one stage, Orban, although he's looking like he might lose. Uh, you, you've got to be of a particular kind of person to be able to get people to continue to vote for you. Donald Trump's biggest success you know, was losing the last election, right? Mm -hmm. Because now he can say, I told you so, and get his second term and get it without too many problems, and people will give him a freaking blank check. Right. Uh, um, whereas his second term would have been really, really rocky. You know, mm -hmm. uh, these midterms, it, things will be bad. He'd be looking at losing seats again. You know, become the president that loses. You know, uh, the, yeah, sorry, he would continue to lose seats even if he won the presidency. You mean the twenty twenty election? Yeah, twenty twenty. Yeah, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but but having having said that, um, I, as you mentioned at the beginning. He may even have been an, an old school paleo yep, conservative. That's right. Type. He certainly appeared that way. Yes, but yeah. regardless of of him, the fact that he managed to get elected on that platform, uh, whether he meant it or not, he, you know, different story. But does that indicate that the people and the and the and the party has shifted from the old school neocon? establishment type old school Republican Party to back going back to a fairly conservative party. Oh yeah, I think possibly and, and uh, post Trump, yeah. if you can find another leader 
that can take this new Republican Party, which is more of a throwback. Oh, yes, but but here's the trick. Winning the states, you know, the, the way that Trump did it, and this is not just in the general election, but also even in the, the, um, in the primaries, was not just as a, you know, an apparently a paleoconservative. It's also using all that popular stuff. Well, yeah, and definitely the popular... remember it's registered voters. Right. It's registered voters that are voting for him. And they're going, yeah, yeah, we like him. So mm-hmm. he's still, even though he seems to have a particular policy platform, he's using all the populist tricks to beat off, you know, everybody else who wasn't doing very well at all. You know, who all the people who thought they were going to win. You right. know? And it, then by the time it became anyone but Trump, it was too late. You know, just too late. Um, <sighs> idiot, but still. You know, but do, do, you think, do you think? Uh, now, if it had been an internal, if there had been an internal vote of the, you know, uh, the way it sometimes used to be, where you know um, the the state party picked the state delegation, Trump would never have been elected. Right. Huh? Well, yeah. Even during the primaries, he won the primary, and there were some of the party elders were even saying, "Oh, if he gets the nomination, we're not going to we're not going to uh, implement him." But then the counter argument was, "What's the point of election? What's the point of That's right. primary? That's right. What's the point That's of?" Right. Yeah, you've mean, gone too far down that track. Yeah, that's yeah. right. You've gone too far down the track. So the issue, the issue really is then that once they'd opened it up to everybody, then they're they're sort of bound to accept that. You know, um, problem is it's people who it's the people who vote that elect the the person at the top, uh, and you might be a you know a, a moderate a moderate um, a Republican, uh, a New England Republican, right? Um, but you're thinking it's going to be Trump, you know, oh, what's the point? You know, there's nobody else beating him. Why would I bother voting? You know, mm-hmm. you know I'm not going to bother in primary, but I don't want, you know, um, Hillary because Hillary's bad because, mm-hmm. you know, Donald has said that she is bad. Right. You know? All the stuff about Hillary Clinton being the, the evil witch from Arkansas. Oh, well, she wasn't from Arkansas, but nonetheless, she, right. <laughs> she was establishment. Yeah, uh, um, you know that that was playing out. All of the stuff was playing out during his his run. As I say, if it had been the old system, uh, he would never have gotten close to it. Um, but that's the way it is. That's what that's what the the, the primaries are like now. But do you think, do you think now that Trump's basically laid down laid down the foundations of this new Republican Party? After Trump, do you think what Ron Ron DeSantis from California, uh, uh, Florida, hair, Florida, hair, Florida? Um, yeah. uh, That's what I was thinking. Do you the hair apparent to the uh, Trump movement? DeSantis wants wants to be. Um, uh, what else have you got? Um, no, DeSantis looks like a, a front runner, but there's you know there's, there'll be people who appear. Out of state politics, you know, uh, who, who take the the, the uh, torch and run with it. Uh, they'll play couple... up. They'll play up all the old tropes that they like to play up. Oh, these trans kids, bathrooms again. It's reappearing in you know places like Virginia and North Carolina. We'll go. We'll go with it. You know, these bad trans kids. We should ban all this, this gender stuff. Um, and they'll play that up. They'll they work that up into quite a leather. Um, remembering that fifty percent of the population doesn't vote. Right? Mm. You only have to motivate, you know, twenty five percent of the people to vote for you, you win. Right? So you know, yes, you can sometimes motivate the people against you, um, but more often than not, you just want everybody in church to come out and vote for you, unless you're you know, not a black church, obviously, but you know, all the white Pentecostals come out and vote for you, and the Catholics as well. Because a lot of Catholics. Do you think Ron DeSantis uh, appearing in the future could it be a similar of history repeating itself with uh, Goldwater and Governor Reagan? Now you get Trump and Governor uh, DeSantis. Could do, could do, yeah. I mean, yes, yes. Um, Goldwater. Goldwater was an ideologue though, and he went down badly. 
Um, no, no, but I mean the idea of Goldwater being this father of the conservative movement yes, of the yes. 60s, and then after him came Governor I, I see. Reagan. I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. I'm not sure because, although yeah, no, um, Trump is not an ideologue, is he a father of the, you know, is he the grandfather, grandson, son of, grandson? Um, no, because it's not coherent. Uh, it would fall to the next president to make the the ideology coherent, mm -hmm. because it's not coherent. Right? Well, could it be? More, this is like the early stages of it, though. Like Trump is it the might be. prototype. Yeah, it might be the yeah. prototype, and the next one comes in, kind of professionalizes it and makes things it more. Yeah, proper. but does it, does it then lose its appeal? All right. If he routinizes some of the policy structures, uh, like the five it doesn't seven. change the red meat, all right? then yes, it could do. Uh, right. But he's, he's got to maintain that that over-the-top popular style, um, even if you routinize stuff underneath. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, like, like you said, it could be the full five-star movement all over again. Huh? Mm. It could be. Yes, it could yeah. be. Could be. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Well, uh, I think we definitely went over time. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that myself. I was just thinking, you know, I really should go. <laughs> First, <Yeah>. stop work. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. Um, uh, you, uh, just one last question. Um, sure. Uh, your your opinion on on probably a big one, but uh, your opinion on on China um, geopolitically. What's do you think what's happening there? China's a lot damn smarter than. Britain um a lot smarter uh even if it has got the weaponry it's watching how the west reacts to uh ukraine it will be having second thoughts about invading taiwan um knowing that the us has very close ties as does japan right um with taiwan the West likely would step in. Okay, uh, the Taiwanese would fight. Um, it would not be. I mean, it's a small island. Yes, you can. You know, you can have the biggest hypersonic weapons you, you like, but it's still a small island. You've got to go and occupy. <laughs> um, so they'll have. They'll be thinking about it. Is it worth their while? No, they can always just keep on chipping away at it. You know, they don't actually have to go and take it now. Uh, they can wait a couple of years, let it all, all you know, settle down, and you know, Donald wins again, and they can all be friends, you know, repeat, repeat, you know, it's and repeat, um, and perhaps let Taiwan, you know, then slip into their you know, their arms, as it were. Internal politics will also be the driver. Will will um, Xi continue? Will he survive? Um, you know, there's always this assumption that uh, well, he's a paramount leader who'll stay there. Uh, it doesn't always work. And if he doesn't do the job, right, and if he's seen as failing, either with the economics or with um, social issues, then he'll be out. Right? Uh, the, the, um, essentially, the, the central committee is, is quite adept at moving people on or shifting people into the background. Even if, even if he's picked them himself, they all have hopes to be the paramount leader at some point. And mm. grief, of course they do. Right? That's like um, uh, Brezhnev looking over Brezhnev and Beria looking over Stalin's shoulder. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, Khrushchev. Sorry, and um, mm. so I, I was reading a review of uh, a review of the life of Brezhnev um, this morning. So it's just like, ah. Oh. Um, so Khrushchev and Beria looking over the shoulder, thinking they could be. You know the the next secretary, and it's like okay, so who's going to get it, right? How do you marshal your people fast enough, right? So Brezhnev wins, you know, and Beria gets shot. Um, you know, Khrushchev he becomes too much of the prankster, the teaser, the the bully. You know, Brezhnev gets the numbers and pushes them out. You know, Brezhnev manages to hang a lot, hang on, because he's a uh, what are they? I forget how the way they describe him. He's a big back slapping sort of guy. Yeah, we're all friends here. We're all friends right. here. And it keeps it going until he's too sick and too ill and can't do it anymore. And then you had that little Chinyanko and, and drop off until you got to Gorbachev. 
um, <laughs> little churn there. Um, What's going with China? Um, will she stay? He will if he plays his cards right. That may not include Taiwan. Uh, it will mean um, keeping America away from it. Uh, their alliance with Russia might not work out. Right? They're having to rethink that. Now, Russia and China have at, at times been best friends and worst enemies, but at the moment, they're still good friends. If Putin falls, what replaces Putin? Mm -hmm. uh, they might have to rethink that. What's their relationship with the countries around them, with Mongolia, with the Kazakhstan, uh, with the countries of the Southeast Asia? Yeah, they've tried invading Vietnam. It usually doesn't work out that well, even with you know huge numerical superiority. So, you know, is, do they want to be uh, militarily expansionist, or will they just continue being economically expansionist until they own everything? In which case, then they go, hey, you know, it doesn't matter. We run everything anyway. Right. You know? Mao was wrong. You know, mm. power does not come out of the barrel of a gun. No, it seems to be the um, asymmetric soft power, asymmetrical warfare seems to be way more effective. <laughs> well, I don't know. CGTN is a pretty woeful um, news carrier. Have you ever watched CGTN? Mm -hmm. uh, um, their news is not bad, but their cultural programs are so... Oh, they're not good. It's like watching American cultural programs sometimes, you know, their documentaries are just a little bit over the top and too American, while the Chinese ones are just a little over the top and too Chinese in their own particular way. Right. Um, it's, it's fascinating watching it, but yes. Okay. So geopolitically, I think they will not, it's not a question of staying in their box. I think they're watching what's happening with Ukraine. Um, they will be very wary about if, if Putin goes, what replaces Putin, because Russia is still this huge country sitting next door to them. Um, they'll still cultivate their relationships with Mongolia and Kazakhstan. Um, internally, well, internally, is China is, is, it's China's business at the end of the day. We can complain about human rights and they'll continue to ignore us. Mm -hmm. um, how will they, you know, we will still have reds under the bed. It's like, fine, we've been doing that for the last 60 years. So a few more years isn't going to stop Australia from complaining about it. All of Peter Dutton's stuff, all oh, these evil reds. It's like, you guys have taken money from them and you guys have travelled there. What are you on about? <laughs> you travel right. there all the time. So don't give us that. Let's, let's step back from the, the reds under the bed. That's just a ploy, a populist, a, an attempt at a populist ploy. Um, is China a threat? Um, not directly, militarily. Um, are they a threat in the case of a world war? Yeah, but everybody is then. So it's kind of, you know, doesn't really matter. Australia is a middle power. Um, uh, it's not a, a, a big, a major player. That's why Scott Morrison keeps on finding himself, you know, the, the, the odd person out in the big meetings because it's not a big player. Right, mm. we are a middle power. We sh our alliances should be with all the other middle powers around us. We should be close to India. We should be close to um, Indonesia. Right? Three hundred million people sitting on our doorstep. Yeah, we should be close to them. You know, mm. um, let's worry about Myanmar. I know what's going on there um, more than um, with our focus has always been on on China as the big bogey person. Um, when in reality, uh, Myanmar is a brutal military dictatorship. Um, China's not a brutal military dictatorship. It might have certain aspects we don't agree with, particularly around Hong Kong, Uyghur peoples and Nepal, um, but it's not a brutal military dictatorship like it is in Myanmar. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's not kleptocratic like it is in, in, has become in, in Laos. Um, Vietnam is actually the good, the good guys. Oh, it's not what has become an authoritarian regime like Cambodia. Right. You know, under Hun Sen. Um, Vietnam, actually, we should be really friendly with Vietnam because um, they've turned out to be quite reasonable. Mm. You know? Well, is that, is that why Australia should be embracing a more of a realist 
Republic type of uh, outlook? Uh, I think I think I think we have a problem if we continue to cuddle up to the US. Uh, I think we really do have a problem there because the US is is not going up. <laughs> It can only, it's only got one way um, it's going, and that's not up. Um, but, well, that's similar to what the late Malcolm Fraser said before he died. He wrote yeah, the book right. uh, Dangerous Allies. Yeah. And he was saying, particularly, Australia is too close to the, American, the Americans, yeah. and if the Americans go crazy, we're going to be sucked down with them. That's right. That's exactly uh, that's, right. And that's coming from a former liberal, conservative type of prime minister. Old school conservative, um, yeah. you know, a bit more, a bit more men's eye. Who was grew up in the country was a farmer actually, so you know, he probably should have been in the National Party, being the Liberal Party. Um, the question about an independent foreign policy it doesn't mean that you know ANZUS is dead. Mm. It just means that you know ANZUS is left a little bit more in the drawer and not pulled out and waved around all the time, um, and that we cultivate the ties with. Indonesia, with uh, India, you know, with Vietnam. You know, people say, but they're communists. So, no, it doesn't, that's not the point. It's about our common security, right? right? And we all know our common security is bound up together and it's the big guy up north, right? And the big guy over the water, right? Because they're going to get into it at some point, mm. right? And we don't want to be, we don't want to be the, the grass underneath an elephant's hoof, right? What is it? Two elephants fight, the grass gets trampled. Right. No, we don't want to be trapped. So we need to look to our common security. Siding up with the US at this point might not be so strategically um, a good idea. Um, our interoperability with all their weapons, sure. Um, while we're buying a whole bunch of tanks, not entirely sure. Are we expecting to be invaded? Uh, otherwise, not sure where we have quite so many tanks. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have coastal that we need coastal defence, but are we intending to project power? Well, no. So the question's always been asked: Well, why do we have aircraft carriers? That's about force projection. What are we projecting our force to for? Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Is there, there, what's our strategic thinking around that? And that comes back to where do we place ourselves in the world? What, how should we look at our foreign policy? How should we look at, our, at foreign affairs? You know, why aren't we, we call ourselves an independent nation? We look to the motherland. You know, Tony Abbott wanting to dish out gongs to Prince Philip. Oh, yeah, you know. I remember that now. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's the old Anglophile headspace. Um, if we've ditched that, have we just put on the Trumpian hat? Well, that's, you know, well, Chinese, capriciousness and drifting. Uh, yeah. Keating and Rudd, uh, do we put on the Chinese hat? That, yeah. Yeah. Why put on anybody's hat? Exactly. You know? Yeah. That's the, that's the other option. Why put on anybody's hat? Why not, you know, okay, it takes a bit more work to be independent, you know, but it also means you don't have to follow the other guy into something unless you're trying to play a populist politics card. Right. You know, unless you're saying, ah, oh, rah, John Howard, rah, rah, rah with the US. Okay, after 9-11, uh, the, the invasion of Afghanistan, still not sure it was a great idea to invade Afghanistan because there was no plan on what to do with it afterwards. Mm. Um, uh, but yes, I can kind of understand the, 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 the sense of we need to be involved in this. The Taliban has been really bad. Mm -hmm. um, Taliban has learned from 20 years out of, out of government. Um, you know, they're, they're saying everybody should, you know, stop fighting in, in Ukraine. You're going, that's a very clever statement from the Taliban. <laughs> My God. Um, <laughs> yeah. But going into Iraq on a lie, which everybody mm. knew was a lie, I was like, what are you doing? Is this just, you know, and, you know, Bush said it, you know, at, at the afterwards, he said, yeah, this was just finishing off business. Mm. I the first war. It's like, yeah. that's, no, we should not have been involved in it, but we trailed along behind. You know, <laughs> sure, Saddam Hussein's a brutal dictator, huh? but we don't take out other brutal dictators. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But Australia's been doing that even we all the way to LBJ, and um, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. I think it's been really embedded. This Anglo part of the old empire mentality of, of yeah. where. But also the Anglosphere. They speak the same language. We can understand what they say. Yeah. You know, if we were a French country, if, sorry, if we were French speaking, we probably look to what France is doing. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, um, similar, similar to what uh, Montreal, Canada, and uh, yeah. Yeah. and France. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Well. Uh, anyway, don't worry. You know, you've been more than generous with your time with me. So, um, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. No worries uh, at all. And I hope it was uh, stimulating for you too. The conversation um uh and um is there anywhere if anyone wants to follow you anyway are you on any social media platform or, or i'm always like i'm always on i'm on twitter more often than not <laughs> that's where i do go um and it's just stuart m jackson at uh that's my that was just stuart m jackson sorry at stuart m jackson s-t-e-w-a-r-t-m-j-a-c-k-s-o-n okay Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for for joining me, and hopefully we'll do this again sometime. Sure, no worries, Daniel. Look okay. forward to it. Okay. Thank you very much. See you.